Okay. So the gang's all here. <laughs> the yes. gang's all here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, Let right. me just say, because it's so much on my mind, I just had a long discussion with one of our faculty members uh, who I talk to every month. And uh, we got talking about, I'm raising this because you could probably help uh, about roles. Uh, I sent, I think you might've gotten the, la the latest learning that I wrote, which is learning 35. If you, if, if you haven't read it, I'll, I can understand that. But. <laughs> If you do, <laughs> you will see that in it, I <clears throat> try to identify six attributes of people, all of which almost everybody has, and they're all positive. Okay. And... Uh, then I, I'm, I'm trying to say that if you got all those attributes manifested in a neighborhood, among other things, you would have peace. So I am mm. I am saying what made me think about it is. I gather every once in a while with a group of people, 20 people called peacemakers. And you've probably run into people who are thought of as going into a situation where there's a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. And trying to deal with violence. And it, it's a, a, a worthy effort. Uh, and to the degree that it has to do with violence created by gangs, uh, we've had more gang <laughs> programs. I mean, I started organizing in Chicago neighborhoods in 1956. And in 1920 at the University of Chicago, they began the first initiative, which is still around, to deal with gangs. <laughs> All kinds of dealing with gangs, people, <laughs> street workers, et cetera. But I, but I was active in neighborhoods. And here are these people. Uh, Last week, we had 160 people killed mm. and 400 and some people injured. Mm. We've been at the anti-violence work <laughs> since 1920. That's just a century. And here we are. How would you explain that? Right. <laughs> it isn't as though it's something that hasn't been attended to. Millions and millions of dollars spent over the years on it. And there we are. Yeah. Well, at any rate, it occurred to me that uh, I don't know of much effort. If you look at the six attributes, if you said in these neighborhoods with a lot of violence, right? There are uh, hundreds of people with those six attributes. I'm, I'm suggesting, guessing, 
that if they got to be manifest, there would be peace. Mm -hmm. That what would most likely actually do something about it <laughs> is there in the neighborhoods in the results of the manifestation of those six attributes. And you could add, if you wanted to, a seventh spirituality. Mm. But at any rate, <coughs> if you're interested in organizing, the question might be, uh, what does an organizer do so that, that those attributes are manifested oh. in a local place? Do you have an answer to that question? Because I would like to know it. I, I just thought, about, thought of it uh, five days ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of turning to you. Saying, oh, okay. <laughs> bringing it up. What would you, <laughs> if, if, if uh, let's see, is it Claire? Yeah. Uh -huh. You send Claire out and say, Claire, <laughs> what we want to see is whether or not a church could be do something that would result in the neighborhood around it manifesting these attributes. The one idea I do have about it, which is still not a very actionable, is <clears throat> that the kind of neighborhood that would activate that is, it isn't about organizing so much as it is creating a culture of contribution. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that maybe you're trying to do with those churches is to see what's their role in a local culture of contribution, of kindness, generosity, etc. <laughs> And now, to put it in an A, B, C, D context, when we say what's on a block, we, we, we don't use those categories. We say there are gifts, there are skills, there are mm -hmm. passions, there are, are, are uh, knowledge, right? So those six are assets too. They're another way of saying, what are the assets in a neighborhood? Uh, I have the skill of playing a saxophone, but I have the ability to be generous. And I have the ability to be generous. So, I'm not saying this is me, but so I have two kinds of assets. Whatever it's worth. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> what, anyway, that's, that's what. Uh, so, so, John, I'm, one, I'm curious if. And if, is there a difference between an attribute and a gift? I feel like you've shared, if I'm remembering correctly, that skills are things that we develop yeah. and gi gifts are, I feel, I feel like there's some overlap between gifts and attributes. Yeah. Just as I said, but gifts and I thought that. 
<laughs> Maybe this is a subhead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say to you, what are your gifts? And you might say to me, I'm generous. Mm. Uh, in in Menasha, where I worked for a long time with a, a, a connector, who has been to 850 households in her neighborhood. <laughs> and incidentally, I ought to send it to you. She just compiled a, a list of those. Uh, let me make a note of that. Okay, uh, all right. I, I have to write something down immediately. I forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, remind me, I, I, was, I was saying, if you look on her list, I don't think you'll see those six things explicitly there. Mm. Mm. In other words, whatever those categories are doing, they're not calling forth those kinds of attributes. Mm -hmm. And that may not be the way to go. I don't know. Uh, but uh, mm. it is occurring to me more and more that... Uh, that if we could reach to a set of relationships where those are the elements of those relationships, that we'd have achieved, I think, what we're looking for. It makes me think of, um, so we're, we're trying to hire some neighborhood high school students for this summer and on their application mm. we have a question about like what are your skills your talents like that yeah. kind of thing and they're uh -huh. putting things like what we would imagine there but yeah. then there's another question that says how do other people describe you yeah and in that question people are writing things like kind like you know they, they oh. the similar words that you're using in these attributes here great the question is, how how do other people describe you? Yeah. Uh huh. And I think we put in there like maybe even like how do people who really love you describe you or like so it wasn't like how do people who don't like you describe you? You don't want that. <laughs> that's not the one we need. Uh huh. And that's interesting. Do you have a list of those answers? Uh, I mean, from the few people who've applied, we do, yeah. yeah. I think we've had three or four apply. Yeah. yeah. But they're of this, this character, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that's, it's the timing of this conversation is very fascinating, John, because the other thing that we are creating right now are some postcards that we're going to share in our neighborhood that the first few just encourage people to meet their neighbors. Mm -hmm. But then the last few, um, we actually stole some material from the abundant community. Mm -hmm. And we were asking folks, um, can you think of an instance when you have seen your neighbors being kind? We were looking at at the capacities that you guys listed um, mm -hmm. of an abundant community. So I think we focused on kindness, uh, generosity, <laughs> uh, fallibility. Except You're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we, we were gonna, um, and we, we'll eventually be able to share those. You could see them, what we're, what we're creating. Um, and it's occurring to me, like, part, part of it is 
we wanted to just cultivate that culture of, you know, and we give like a little example from our own neighbors, right, who embody those things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also occurring to me that like, we want to be prepared, I think, to also hear those stories. Um, yes. You know, so that they're not just, I mean, it's hopefully they can think of stories of a neighbor that they have who embodies one of these attributes. Mm -hmm. And then if those stories can be shared in some mm -hmm. way, it starts to create a new narrative for the neighborhood. Yes. Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And your insight here might be <clears throat> that it might be that you would be more likely to identify people who are thought to have those characteristics if you ask not, if you don't ask the person you're talking to. That's right. But you're asking them about somebody else on the block. Is there anybody on the block who, who you think was being especially generous? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you tell me a story? Why is that? Why do you think that? Yeah. Yeah. That, well, I'd love to see the result. Of, now, what you just described, are you doing that or working it up or what? It'll be June, June, July. Well, these high school students who are hiring will help us go and deliver all of these things in the neighborhood. Uh-huh. And they'll ask these kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, uh, maybe on those six, there are a couple you hadn't asked about. Yeah. You might look and see if there, uh, whatever you're asking about are any of the other ones on that I have on that list. Yeah. Uh, something else you might add. Well, I'd love to see the result of that. That's sensational. <laughs> Would really be great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think we yeah. could easily figure out a way to do that. I mean, I put the list, I went, I went and check, I went online while you were talking and found the list. Mm -hmm. um, in your thing and put them in the chat window here and I mean I could imagine even like like you know a little postcard that's like circle the ones of these that you've seen in the neighborhood and then follow up with them to share stories about what they saw but yeah right right mm -hmm. yeah have you seen? Yeah, have you great. seen? Yeah, like yeah, show, right. yeah. tell us about when you've seen one yeah. of these things in the neighborhood. It's happening in the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Then get the story and see who the people are. Right. Now that leads to the second thing that we we're talking about this morning, which is there's another way of saying what's in a neighborhood from an asset perspective, and and it's people who perform certain kinds of roles, okay? Uh, everybody has those attributes, but there are people who perform roles who uh, that may not be something that everybody has, right? Mm -hmm. And a list might include so far uh, healers, uh, <clears throat> people who are the conscience, artists, conveners. Bridgers, which is different than another one, connectors, voices, visionaries, and executors. <laughs> I got that from Illich years ago. 
the the word we think of an executive director. <clears throat> it comes from executor. Executor developed in English inheritance law, going back to the Middle Ages. And it's a person, if if you die and you want to have something happen, it's a person who will make it happen. Mm. And it's essential characteristic of that kind of a person is their fidelity to your purposes, <laughs> right? An executor of your state, you're looking for somebody. <laughs> who you have absolutely trust to do what you wanted to have done. Hmm. So we were thinking about, is there something different than an organizer? And it might be that there are people who are like executors. People who who know how to, to do something you want to have done. They're your agents, right? <laughs> and you might say, well, that's an organizer. At any rate, so you see, you've got the, the, the four things we would normally ask. You have, then you have the attributes and then you have these roles. So there are three ways of classifying what are the assets in a neighborhood of individuals than to go to association. I'm, so, yeah. Oh, sorry, John. I just gonna. I have to say how excited I am with this list of roles. <laughs> <laughs> this is really, this is wonderful. Yeah. Well, you could ask that question on your card. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. you could not only ask about the attributes, you could ask about the roles mm -hmm. or one or the other. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be there... interesting if, if you sent, if you sent 50 and 50, <laughs> one of, what, what would be the rates of return hmm. <laughs> on ro roles versus attributes? Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what uh, just to see what motivates people. Right. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Is there a, is, is there a, a document anywhere that kind of gives thumbnails of these different roles, like? Just uh, began to think about them this week. Okay. In fact, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I'll probably write one of these learnings with uh, April, uh, donor who's one of our faculty who I was mm -hmm. discussing this with. Uh, okay. So at any rate, but yeah, I'll I, I'm, I'm going to send her something. I'll send it to you too. Okay. Good. Well, you must have had something you were interested in talking about. <laughs> Not that I, <laughs> anything you could do <laughs> to, yeah. to, to expand, clarify, add to those two sets of notions and any information you collect, it'd just be a treasure for me. I don't know. <laughs> you. Yeah. yeah. I think so we're trying different ways of eliciting what people have to offer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and just because we've experimented with these four ways doesn't mean that there aren't other ways of of eliciting things. Right. Mm. That you're eliciting something different or you get better response. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. Yeah. But it, it's, it's sort of, I'm expanding my idea of what the assets in a neighborhood are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting how it intersects with some of our teaching um, because we, oh, sure. we talk a lot about joy mm -hmm. and we, we define joy as, as authenticity, like doing, uh, you know, operating in a way that feels really resonant with you. And I think one of the things I love about these roles is it gives some permission for people to contribute to their neighborhood well-being in a way that's authentic. Uh -huh. um, you know, so if, if I don't resonate with the term artist, but I resonate with healer, Mm -hmm. that's, that's okay, right? It's, it doesn't, I don't have to be both. I can, yes, yeah, honor one. So that's, right. yeah. Yeah, it is. The attributes, I think, in general, you're trying to call forth in everybody. Mm -hmm. But the roles, I don't think they're of the same character. They're the point you're just making. They're, they have more to do with different natures of people. Yeah. Right. Mm. Cool. Yeah. 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 Incidentally, there's another one that uh, that uh, <clears throat> it isn't explanatory, uh, uh, and it's uh, a, a guy uh, who's now a faculty member, one of the first faculty members, and was a great graduate student would be when I was at Northwestern, uh, his name Tom Dewar. And uh, at the time, he had some relationships with some Native people in, in Wisconsin, in the uh, North, in, in uh, reserves. And uh, he got to know the chief of one band pretty well. And he, uh, he talked with uh, him about the roles people form in, uh, in a tribe. Hmm. And incidentally, that sort of fits. There's something about, uh, I've, I'm thinking more and more uh, just about talking to some of the people we know who are members of tribes about roles mm -hmm. and maybe if you've got any places where uh you know there are native people in, you know around that's something one of your churches could do what, the, what are the roles of a tribe within a tribe what roles do people have well this 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 uh chief uh said to him well we have people and he, and he named a name which is a Indian name he says but there is no English word for the name <laughs> hmm. and and it is he says this is a person who is known uh, it's like they have this role people know it of keeping track of of what's going on in our community and noting anything that happens that begins to erode or could erode our tribe's relationship, our culture. And so Tom named that a tuck pointer. Right? <laughs> Somebody who <laughs> sees the mortar of the yeah. community beginning to go away, right? Yeah. And this person uh, doesn't have any authority. All They can't sanction anybody as they observe something that looks like it's erosive. They can talk to them. And, 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 and they have some hot, they are people of high regard, right? And uh, so there is some a role of somebody who is constantly thinking about 
is there anything happening that is eating away at our community? <laughs> yeah. That's a role. But I don't think we have it in Western society much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's an interesting role. Now, what are profits? Is this a part of uh, what the prophets did? I mean, I don't know. I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. It feels like in some ways the prophet and I, I don't I'm not an authority on this. I'm, this is just my opinion. <laughs> so yeah. but it feels like the, the the prophet kind of integrates the visionary and the tuck pointer and the executor. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Right, there's because it's fidelity to the community or to God's vision for yeah. Israel. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So I, hmm, yeah. That's just my. That's such an intriguing question, John. I really want to play with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I talk every month with, with Walter Brueggemann, so this is a good one to raise with him. <laughs> <laughs> he probably have more enlightening things to say than we do, too. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but he's a I know about he's that. A scholar. <laughs> <laughs> he's a scholar. <laughs> Studies and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Also, I think it's interesting just a an additional note on the, the tuck pointer. Um, one of the things that I, I heard uh, in an interview a few years ago is that, uh, again, in Western society, we don't, we don't have anyone in our community that's paying attention to this eroding. But uh, in Amish communities, they, mm. they do. Is that uh, right? Yeah, and people, I, and I, again, I haven't researched this, but this is what I learned in this interview. Um, the Amish, you know, we associate, we assume, or many people assume that the Amish are just opposed to all technology. Mm -hmm. But actually, they have a procedure that they use where they, they have early adopters who test out technology. Mm-hmm. The rest of the community observes their use of that technology, and then together they decide whether or not it's allowed based on how it impacts the community at large. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a good example. Yeah. Because, and, and what they prioritize is um, proximity to family and community. Um, and interdependence. So yeah. if, the, if the technology weakens those three things, they say, no, we don't want it. Right. And if it doesn't weaken those things, they're fine with it. And each yeah. uh, kind of parish gets to make its own choices about that. Okay. So there's yeah. not a governing, you know, national yeah. body. It's, it's, uh, it's localized. Uh, that's great. Now, I heard a story years ago, which must be a manifestation of this. Hmm. I can't remember who told it to me, but said that <clears throat> a man was <clears throat> driving down the road in Amish country, and he saw a, uh, <clears throat> a farmer with a threshing machine pulled by horses, but the thresher had a an a internal combustion engine that made it go around. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, and or something of that order, right? Was, uh, mm -hmm. And 
so he stopped and he, he asked the Amish guy, why, why, I thought you were against motor. And the guy said, no, he said, we're against motors that take us apart. Yes. These motors keep us together. So, so cars take you away. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> These help you sustain, right? It's exactly your point, I guess. Yeah. You know, this embody that kind of stuff. Well, that's great. Yeah. Would it be nice if... Uh, uh, now, I... Years ago, uh, a, a guy I know who later committed suicide, fortunately, mm. made a list of things that he thought had eroded local neighborhoods, community life. Oh. And the first one of all was air conditioners. Mm -hmm. Now, I live in a neighborhood where all the houses are Victorian. They all have lovely porches. I walk the dog all twice a day. One out of a hundred porches has somebody sitting on them in the summer. Right. In the summer was when people used to sit on them. <laughs> they weren't really good in the winter, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And when I think back to my childhood and the block or two around me in the summer, everybody was on their porch. Mm -hmm. So at least the primary presence, the possibility of, of knowing each other was there. So there's a technology <laughs> that, is, that uh, is uh, the Amish. It'd be interesting to see whether the Amish believe in air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there, but there are a lot of things things I can see in my own lifetime like that, that, that used to pull people together. I played almost every evening stickball or some, some other games in the street in front of our house. I don't know anybody much who does that anymore. Yeah. The street was our park. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, right. so, anyway. mm. well, has Claire been out doing some organizing or? not yet <laughs> <laughs> been working on it have you got something you've learned that we can learn from you Ooh, that's a good question um I think one thing that I've been really reflecting on a lot is just, um, and I think John, you were the first one to bring this up, was just this idea of uh, kind of like strength in numbers. Um, so where we're hoping to do our organizing in Kansas, um, not letting people do it by themselves, um, but making sure they have at least one or two other people that are doing it with them. Um, and then also kind of interesting, this conversation about these roles that people fill. Um, when we're having people fill out our application to become our these organizers around the state, um, we're having them fill out what role they fit in their community. Um, and I think, the, I'm trying to remember the exact four roles that I said, but connector is one, messenger. Um, oh, messenger. Adam, do you remember the other two? Connector, messenger. Oh, expert. Um, what, what was it? Expert. So expert. it'd be like people that are experts from their lived experiences. Like local expert. Yeah. And then, and then um, doer or some version of that. Great. And we are that cohort that we're starting, we're the first one we're doing is in Southwest Kansas, which is 
a very interesting <laughs> place in the world, very rural, mm -hmm. but it actually has growing population because there's an increase in um, immigration from Central America primarily, I think, and they are, it's, it's a place where the white population has become the minority, but they still have no white, like all of the elected officials in the area <laughs> are still <laughs> yeah. all white. Yeah. Um, and the cohort we've been able to recruit through someone who I think is an amazing connector, actually, she was in our last cohort, is we have all of these Latina women who are signing up for this cohort. And it's going to be a really interesting group because they just have a different perspective than yeah, we do. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, Incidentally, in general, it strikes me that uh, the uh, the Hispanic people from Latin America, at least that I I'm aware of, uh, come I don't know, modernized societies are places where all the pieces are torn apart. They're like a jigsaw puzzle. It's just pieces laying on a table. And that's what modernism is. It's tearing apart the whole community, right, into pieces. And, and uh, a culture is a, a word that's telling about what holds the pieces together. Right. And that in general, you're much more likely in a Hispanic community to find the elements of wholeness <clears throat> than you will in, in other ones. So that the standard anthropological elements of culture which are, are uh, food, uh, arts, language, and faith all go together. So in that sense, and if you, if you look back in, in one of the uh, blogs that I wrote, if you go to the abundant community and look under blogs and look under my name, God, there's so many of these that, are, that aren't me, aren't me, but uh, there's one about paying attention to, to Mexican uh, communities in the U.S. And the reason is because it tells about a study on life expectancy in the US by white, black, and Hispanic. And as you would expect, African Americans have the shortest lifespan. Then comes Caucasians. And then comes the longest lived people, Hispanics. Now, usually Hispanics are someplace <laughs> with the, with the uh, uh, African-American people uh, on these mm -hmm. comparisons. It's not true in terms of how long you live. Why is that? And the uh, person who is making the report that I, I was using thought it had something to do with culture. So, um, the degree that a culture is manifested in associational life, right? Uh, what's going on there, I think, is 
literally something holistic, right? What is broken apart in Western culture is still maybe a remnant, but still coheres. Uh, when I go to church and I come out of church and I am surrounded by rock music, I don't associate the two, right? And when I go to a restaurant and eat something from a menu, I don't associate it with rock music. I live a broken life. So uh, a culture pulls, pulls us together, <laughs> pulls our attributes together, pulls our roles together. Those roles are all about what you need to be together. They're antithetical to Western hyper-individualism. So, Claire, thank you. <laughs> A good point. Awesome. Wow, I, I'm just soaking that in. That was, that was incredible. The, the thing, sometime if you got a bunch of people who are really serious about this, I'd like to have a discussion about culture. And, uh, the reason is that most of what we call problems could better be described as the result of uncultured, broken people. And, and so, uh, and that's what, if I could prevail on you, read the most recent. I think you get them, right? The learnings? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most recent one, 35, because it's trying to get at this question of how do you create a culture? And it tells a story. It's, it, it's saying these six attributes, right, when they come together, create well-being when they're manifested in a place. And then it tells a story about how, how that might, how, how I think I saw that happen. And, and it's in a Swedish neighborhood. <laughs> which maybe has a little different culture anyway. But, mm. but as you, you think ahead about what you're doing, almost everything that people think is wrong will be de better dealt with by culture change than by program intervention. And that's the point of this last one. That's great. I don't even know if we had an agenda for today, but I think we succeeded <laughs> in whatever we were supposed to do, so. Sure. Yeah. As you go along, when, I don't know whether this fits what you're doing at all. 
But um, I spend time in a cup with, with people like, like, like here, with, with people who are uh, experimenting with identifying uh, the gifts and capacities of local residents. And I think that's a, the most proven starting point for change. And as you go ahead, I'd, I'd be, and you had churches that wanted to experiment with, with identifying the, uh, the gifts, talents, maybe attributes of uh, local people. I'd be happy, as I do as well, to meet with them on a monthly basis, say, and share the stuff that, that we've learned and are learning. Uh, so if you, if you found two or three places, churches, neighborhoods, whatever, uh, that were interested in this, I'd be willing to spend time with them. Uh, I wouldn't want to spend much time persuading them. <laughs> I'd be I willing to spend time sharing practical knowledge <laughs> <laughs> on how to get going. Uh, and I'll have a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if if you if you run into that, that's something I would uh, I would be interested in doing. Yeah. Good. Because sometime I want I would like to have then some other get more and more of these groups together. But you got to get them started first. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I hope you recruit a few for us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, we're trying. Yeah. We've we've got some folks. I think uh, there because of COVID. I think it's hard for them to get started. But I think there are some folks who would be interested in those conversations really soon. Did did I send you? Right, I'll bet you I didn't. We now have the story of, uh, let me write this down before I forget it. The story of, <coughs> you know Julie Philippek. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. <coughs> well, she found uh, a person in a neighborhood <coughs> who was a, uh, who she persuaded, didn't think it was very hard, to be a connector. And uh, so, Sami, if I said, this uh, middle-aged uh, woman, uh, really authentic to the neighborhood, who, <laughs> took seriously finding out about her neighbors and visited 850 households in her neighborhood, asking them the questions about you know, your gifts, etc. Yeah. So she does this and then COVID comes before she could do any connecting. But, uh, and we've gotten her to write the story of what happened during COVID. But hardly any of it would have happened if she hadn't known 850 people. Mm. 
And yet, and this is, I think, the, the real discovery. A lot of thinking about connectors is that the connector is doing something with information that puts people together who aren't together. And that's right. And that's good. And that really <laughs> gets things going. But and you, when you read this story, and she's too modest to, to really uh, say it, I think. Or I'm not even sure she sees it. But in this story, because she's the only person everybody knows and knows at a, me at a meaningful level. Yeah. Told, told her about their gifts. It's personal. Most of the story of what they did is the result of people going to her <laughs> with an idea and saying, and in essence, can you help? Hmm. And the that's help a, was, <laughs> was not like do something. It was like connect me to people. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. They had the idea. They didn't have the relationship. She had the relationship. <laughs> And so she did the connecting. We're always thinking of the, the this initiator being the connector. She had such comprehensive relationships that the the initiator was the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yes. So read the story with that light in in mind, hmm. and, and it's why Claire. Uh, when I think we might have said this to you, but let's, let's emphasize it again. When anybody is meeting somebody one to one in a discussion, uh, they are doing three things at once. Number one, they're getting information that's personal from a neighbor. Number two, because they are getting positive information, they are building a positive relationship. Number three, they are trying to determine whether this, what role this person might perform. We'll put, use that language. Would they, are they interested in doing what you, what she's doing. So when you walk away from an effective discussion, you have three things that have happened. Information, relationship, and activation. Okay. <laughs> so the Vicky story is about the middle attribute. <laughs> it is about the relationship that she had with people that enabled those people to make their visions come true. That's really good, John. That makes, that's like, that's, all of our like there's so many alarm bells going off like i'm thinking about our churches yeah. who have obsessed themselves over information and activation but not done any of the relationship work and our curriculum is trying to say let some of those things go and and be connectors like yeah all mm -hmm. that that's good mm -hmm. yeah right right well this this idea of a two-way connector <laughs> is uh, something I learned <laughs> from her. Mm -hmm. And I'll send you her story, uh, which does not, I think, adequately portray 
what I'm telling you about. <laughs> <laughs> because she she doesn't see herself, I think, mm -hmm. as being uh, really significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah, that's consistent with attributes, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. right, right, yeah. So. right, mm. right, right. <laughs> so, which is wow. an interesting other question. She doesn't see the meaning of what she's doing the way I tell it to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, is it more important to have meaning or is it more important to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can tell you for her community, it probably is more important that she's doing it. Do it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, and we have the luxury of trying to give it meaning. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, 